This is the seventh of my eight autobiographical books up to the age of 30, and it tells the time between 1963 and 1966 when I was doing a postdoctoral degree, a DPhil, at Oxford University on witchcraft in Tudor and Stuart, England. When I went back after being an undergraduate at Worcester College, I started to attend a few lectures on research, and I've underlined some of these. One of the ones I've underlined is Mr. Hill, that's the famous historian and master of Balliol, Christopher Hill. And it was Christopher Hill who I was first <coughs> assigned as a supervisor. We didn't choose them, we were assigned them. And I was delighted because he was one of my undergraduate heroes for his books on the Civil War period. So I went to see him and we tried to work out something, but after a few weeks of struggling on another subject, um, we agreed that wasn't working. And he asked me what I would like to study, and one of the subjects I suggested was witchcraft and magic. And so he said, well, why don't you go and see my young friend um, who is interested in this subject, Keith Thomas of St. John's College. So I went to see Keith and I became his first student. He was only eight years older than me and later became a very distinguished historian and administrator and um, head of Oxford University Press and so on, and head of the British Academy. And to my great good fortune, not only was he a wonderful supervisor and very assiduous and hardworking, but he was also writing on exactly my theme, but at a broader level, on his book, uh, his famous book, Religion and the Decline of Magic, which was very lengthy and an amazing book. And he was doing this macro study while he was supervising me to do the micro study of the county of Essex and its witches. So we had so much to talk about and share. And he gave me wonderful guidance, even though he was also learning to be uh, a DPhil supervisor. He would write me letters um, encouraging me. I think th these chapters you sent are excellent, particularly the sociological approach to recent interpretations. And so I was very encouraged, but he didn't let anything pass which wasn't up to his very high standards. So I would come away dazed from his long supervisions. He also once or twice wrote me long, longish letters advising me what, uh, how I should write. Uh, avoid loose rhetoric and journalistic writing. Define your terms very carefully and aim at the maximum precision. Take one question at a time and deal with it exhaustively. Excellent advice. And so he gave me a really thorough postgraduate training in how to do a PhD or DPhil, which I've then applied throughout my life in supervising other people. I myself wrote frequently to him, and um, so I've got both sides of the correspondence, and he kindly sent me back, though I had most of them, the letters I'd written to him over the three years of our time together on this particular DPhil. Every year he was required to write a report on how I was getting on, and this is one of the reports in which he is mostly encouraging um, and making good progress in his study. He has combed through. He is a very keen student, and though his expo exposition is sometimes rather careless, I expect him to bring his work to a satisfactory conclusion. So slightly guarded, but enthusiastic, and this is at the end of my a uh, year and a half of, or year and a quarter of doing this. I also had great good fortune in encountering another leading historian at that time, the Regis Professor of History, uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, later, later Lord Dacre. And not only was he very kind and supportive, and we used to meet and uh, chat, and he um, encouraged me to give papers and so on, but he also, um, during my time, was writing a little book, much slimmer book, on witchcraft in Europe at a wider level. 
um, and this is his book which came out as a penguin. And so again we had a lot to talk about both in general about historical methods but also about the history of witchcraft which he knew about uh, as a continental uh, European historian as, a, as well as an English historian. And he used to write me um, every month or so wonderful letters, long, long handwritten letters. He obviously didn't keep copies um, and I preserved all these and they give me lots of advice. Um, at the top he's advising me not to mix my metaphors, uh, not I, I mustn't talk in the fashionable jargon of sociology. Um, and so he was giving me worldly advice and later he supported me uh, academically as a kind of patron. So I had this intellectual relationship but also again I kept all my letters to him or copies of them at this time I was keeping um, I write here in his patronage role you kindly said I might have your support in my bid to get financial aid for my London project so I was using him as a reference for work I was applying for and he helped to get me some lecturing at Nottingham University others there were many others who also, and this is part of uh, postgraduate work, getting to know a network of people. One of them was actually someone who taught me as an undergraduate, Lady Rosalind Clay, who had been very helpful and supportive when I was studying the Tudors and Stuarts. And we remained friends, and I used to go and have tea with her um, every week or two, and we wrote long letters to each other. Her writing was fairly... Um, illegible as you can see but it was full of the family and she was part of a distinguished and amazing family and gave me the gossip of history. Another person who was very influential and who had been influential as an undergraduate was Brian Harrison who um, became particularly important as I became a DPhil student because he had this wonderful card indexing system one fact one card showed me how it worked showed me how to take notes and so on and so he deeply influenced my research methods. Again when I went to the Essex record office I had to learn the very difficult kinds of handwriting which I'll show later and the person who really taught me couldn't have been better she had written the standard book on paleography or reading local documents Hilda Grieve and we became friends. She was head of the search room at the Essex Record Office and we became friends and she gave me a huge amount of practical help. I was also in touch with other people interested in witchcraft. This was Catherine Briggs who had written um, two very uh, interesting books on folklore and magic in the 16th and 17th, uh, 70th, uh, 16th and 17th centuries and she was kind and encouraged me to be in touch with the Folklore Society and so on. Another very distinguished historian in Oxford at that time was the uh, local and regional historian Joan Thirsk and uh, I kept up a correspondence with her and she read some of my materials, encouraged me to come to her seminars and so on. So this network, there must have been 20 or so, you think of yourself doing one of these defills on your own, but it's actually a network activity. And local history was particularly important at this time, and I did a local history study to it as part of my thesis. And the, the most senior fig figure in this field was W.G. Hoskins, um, who had written a wonderful study of a Midland village, Wigston Magna, and... I went to his seminars and he sent me one or two of his pieces and this is a note from him. I began to get interested though at the same time in the anthropological approach to witchcraft. Keith Thomas was very interested in anthropology and history so he suggested I went to lectures and fortunately just at that time there were a series of lectures going on in the anthropology department about witchcraft and um, so I went to these and got to meet the leading anthropologists of witchcraft at that time. I tried to read widely on the history of witchcraft and 
these are a few of the books, um, Evans Pritchard's famous summary of witchcraft among the Azamli, Cluckhorn, Levi Strauss, um, and so on, Marwick, Max Marwick. So I read widely in anthropology, not just on witchcraft, and became really fascinated by it. The most important anthropologist I met, one of the greatest of the 20th century anthropologists, was Edward Evans Pritchard, and he was quite elderly, but I got to know him quite well and was very fortunate to have him as my uh, DPhil examiner at the end of my thesis. And he was enthusiastic about what I'd written and kindly agreed to write the preface to my first book, which was on witchcraft. So um, I learnt a huge amount from him as well. I came across a whole set of original documents which had hardly been used, and this is a wonderful thing if you're doing a DPhil. Uh, this is um, an assize record written uh, in Latin, and it took me weeks and months to learn how to decode this, uh, and a real struggle, and at times I thought I could never do it. This was slightly known, the assize records, much less used because they'd only recently been unearthed, were the wonderful ecclesiastical court records, particularly of the archdeaconries. Here is one of these, and again, not easy to read, though this isn't too bad because it's at least in English, uh, and it's a witchcraft examination uh, in the ecclesi ecclesiastical courts. What were absolute nightmare, and there were huge volumes of them, uh, were the uh, prosecutions for various offences, including witchcraft, which I had to go through, and which were written in uh, contracted Latin, just a, f a, a few letters to mean a whole word or sentence. So for me, it was like learning Japanese or Chinese, and it, it took me a, a huge effort to do it, but finally I more or less got the hang of it. Once you'd got all your material, what did you then do with it? Well, using Brian Harrison's method, one thing I did was to break it all up under headings, cunning folk, expensives. So these are the markers which divide the different um, notes I was taking because indexing your material makes all the difference between an, an average and a good piece of work. You've got to be able to find everything on a particular subject when you come to write about it. So once you've gathered it, you have to do all the indexing. And it also makes you concentrate on why exactly you took this. So these are some index cards referring Perkins' Damned Art was a 17th century book about witchcraft, while Krieger on the right was a reference to um, an anthropological work, and MN means my notes. So I brought together anthropology and history through these indexes. I also made a local study, and this required me to set up a new way of doing local history where you could reconstitute different subjects and different people. And this is notes on the ecclesiastical courts where I've summarized the cases so I can put them under cert certain categories and find everything I need for what I'm writing about. There was a huge amount of analysis as well as writing, of course. You have to visually spread out your material and do graphs and tables. And so this is um, an analysis of animals as victims, what kind of animals were um, bewitched, uh, the number of cases, um, how many people pled being pregnant to try and avoid punishment, and so on. And also, you need to set out your material so that it um, covers uh, all sorts of um, family relationships. This is the sex of the accuser, the sex of the person they accused, um, what they're quarrelling about, um, and other background factors set out in a kind of tabular form. From this, you then start to 
plan and uh, I learned the methods of very carefully planning paragraphs. Um, this is a, a talk or a, a paper I'm writing about um, the witch's familiar, the little creature that um, served the witch's wishes sent by the devil and um, I'm planning out an essay on that. I also made a study of the great witchcraft prosecutor in this area and uh, Matthew Hopkins at the bottom and his relationships to different people to see who was at the center of his network of accusations and um, activities. Elizabeth Clark on the top left or middle left is obviously very important for him. And finally, you had to write, and I wrote and wrote and wrote, draft after draft, very carefully commented on by Keith Thomas, and gradually getting better. I learnt that only the actual writing makes you really think about what it is you have to say, it sets up new questions, and then you have to write another draft. Um, you haven't expressed it correctly, and you don't know where you're going while you're writing, but gradually you stumble towards some sort of overall narrative. I spent two years in Oxford doing the research and in Essex, and then my parents retired, and just before they did, I returned for my third year to the Lake District. This was a wonderful choice because it meant I was away from all the pools and attractions of Oxford, and I could sit at home go out for walks with our dog in the Lake District, but basically sit in a quiet, secluded shed, garden shed, which my parents kindly let me use, and it's on the bottom right in this photograph in our back garden. And the garden shed, which later led me into all my workplaces away from the strains of the house, was where I developed my thesis through a very cold winter but also a couple of summers, and that peace and quiet allowed me, with occasional visits to Oxford to see my supervisor, to write up most of my thesis. From time to time I was surrounded by my family, my father on the top right, my grandmother sitting below, uh, my mother second from the left, and my two sisters and a cousin, and they would feed me with coffee and uh, meals, when they were around, though sometimes I was on my own. And one of the particularly important points at this time was not the only the writing, but getting interested in methods of communicating and uh, gathering information. I became very interested in how you could collect material from archives, because often it spent you had to spend a lot of time there. So I experimented, as I did later, with using tape recorders, uh, which were just becoming, um, this is the electronic revolution in this period. I was also interested in filing systems, very interested. So these lateral suspended filing systems, I couldn't afford them, so I actually made my own uh, with paper clips and files and um, uh, curtain rails. and my workspace became filled with that sort of thing. I was also interested in how you did correlations. It was Computers were really not suitable at this time, and the numbers of my cases were too small. So the computing service in Oxford suggested I use this uh, clip method, Cope Chat, as it was called, uh, the people who made this. And so you would clip under various variables and then stick your pin in, and the ones that came out fitted that. It's a pretty clumsy method, but it was on the way to computerization. And so I tinkered with that and spent quite a lot of time putting stuff on. I then had to um, learn how to um, express my findings. So I started to give a few lectures some of them were to graduate societies. This is the Devagilla Society, which is the History Society of Balliol College. And uh, it was rather uh, an honour to be 
invited to dinner and to give a talk there. But the main vehicle of this was when I was asked to give um, a course for the Workers' Educational Association, uh, 24 lectures on social history, which was important economically to me, and also my first chance to lecture to an audience. Uh, I found it pretty tough, and at first didn't go very well, and I didn't devote enough time to it. But um, towards the end, I got the hang of it, and I enjoyed going out to visit them on my motorbike, and also writing a syllabus that I had to write, which in many ways um, still expresses some of the views I held about this period. It was out in Ainsham, not a few miles away from Oxford. I wasn't just working and um, doing serious things. I was also leading a, not as active a social life as an undergraduate, but quite. And so, for example, I went to my ex-girlfriend's Guy Fawkes in London. Uh, I'm not sure whether I went in a cloak and a dagger, with a dagger, but um, I was invited to these things, and this was at uh, in my first term as a postgraduate student there. Um, and I also went to some cultural events, not as many as the rush of undergraduate life, because I was busier, but um, I went to a Mozart evening, and um, there were some very distinguished players, Stuart Bedford and so on, and I was able to buy more tapes for my tape recorder and classical music. I would also um, not just do classical music, but also folk music. Uh, I joined the Cecil Clark, uh, Cecil, um, uh, anyway, <laughs> the Cecil Sharp Club, which was a folk club in Oxford, and um, this was the English Folk Dance and Song Society, uh, where I met one of my girlfriends and go, went to hear some of the great folk singers. Um, I also went to plays as above. I was also involved with um, charitable things as I had been as an undergraduate, and um, I pledged gifts and helped with the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief, Oxfam, uh, as a postgraduate. And again, although I didn't have very much money, uh, I tried to give little bits to charity. We were encouraged as Christians, and my Christianity is rather absent now, as, as is evident, unlike my undergraduate days. But I tried to give perhaps 10% of my money away, and here I am contributing to the House of the Urchins Fund, Father Borelli. I was a great fan of Father Borelli, who did work in Italy among street children. And so I've given um, two pounds, ten shillings, which was actually quite a lot of time at, money at that time. This is um, towards the end of my PhD, so I'm now living at home. Perhaps could afford it better then. The heart of all the <coughs> book, as with the other books, are letters. Um, here I'm writing to my parents. I had a two and a half hour session with my supervisor in which, among other things, we went through my essay on which is familiars. He seemed to find it interesting and gave me a load of references to attitudes to animals, for instance. And um, so I explained how my PhD was doing, because I was mostly away from my parents. They were still mainly in India. And um, in return, I got these very detailed letters from my mother. So we were having a kind of intellectual discussion, which again influenced me hugely. She was very interested in what I was doing, and she was beginning to do her own independent historical research, which I tried to support by finding her books and references and people she could be in touch with. I was also in touch with various girlfriends. I didn't have such a serious girlfriend during most of my postgraduate time, but one of them um, I uh, spent time with and she wrote to me because she was away in London, and I wrote to her. And these letters also take me inside my emotional life. 
I was still, and this was the last phase in which I was doing this really, still trying to write poetry, which although it's poetically pretty dodgy um, and derivative, because poetry is different from prose, you can actually speak your emotions. Joys so deep from bud to leaf, spring and surge and quick relief, beauties so strange beyond belief, and the ecstasy so brief. You can see the uh, awfulness of it, but it, it uh, got inside one's emotions and reveals them at that time. Then I had to decide what I was going to do. Uh, I toyed with various jobs. One was to work with the um, Garter King of Arms, A.R. Wagner, as his research assistant, and uh, he was very encouraging, and I might have got a job there, though it would have been um, part-time and not very well paid. But I was so much in love with anthropology now that when my um, ex-undergraduate tutor, Harry Pitt, wrote and said that there were some postdoctoral research fellowships uh, and research studentships from the Social Science um, Research Council. Um, I pursued this, and this was a time when funding was much more um, beneficent uh, than now. And so uh, I pursued this and was able to apply to the London School of Economics and um, got uh, some very warm replies from Sir Raymond Firth, Raymond Firth, who was head of the Department of Anthropology at the LSE, and um, he gave me suggestions and finally admitted me to do the two-year conversion master's course at the LSE. Around the same time, I got my undergraduate um, MA. You just had to wait for your MA, and here I am uh, in about 1965 with my mother, um, in Oxford getting my MA degree, which I got at the same time as my uh, uncle, Robert Rhodes James, got his degree. So we had a party. And in that year, I met my first wife. And uh, at the end of the year, um, I married in Hawkshead Church, where I'd lived as a boy, my grandmother on the left and mother above her and father, and uh, my wife Jill, and her mother and father and close friend. And you see me here on my 25th birthday, 20th of December, 1966, after I'd gone, gone to the London together. And finally, I finished off my DPhil when I was at the LSE, and here is the award of my DPhil from Oxford University, examined by not only Evans Pritchard, but also by Christopher Hill, one Marxist historian and one Catholic anthropologist who passed it um, without really asking many, very many questions, but were both enthusiastic. So this is the end of my doctoral three years.